The idea of constructing a massive railway gun was not a novel concept by the time World War II loomed on the horizon. The Germans had already experimented with large railway artillery during World War I, famously deploying the Paris gun to shell the French capital from a staggering distance. However, what set the Schwerer Gustav, also known as Heavy Gustav, apart from its predecessors was its unprecedented scale. This colossal weapon was a testament to the German high command's obsession with engineering marvels designed to break through even the most formidable defenses. The impetus for developing Heavy Gustav came from a strategic need. Anticipating another war, the German military sought a weapon capable of obliterating the heavily fortified Maginot Line, a series of French defenses that stretched along the German border. The challenge was not merely to destroy these forts but to do so from a safe distance, beyond the reach of French artillery. The armaments manufacturer Krupp, known for its expertise in heavy weaponry, was tasked with this monumental challenge. They proposed a gun with a caliber of 80 centimeters, dwarfing the largest naval guns of the time, such as those on the Bismarck, which had a 38 centimeter caliber. The sheer size of the heavy Gustav was mind-boggling. Its barrel alone measured 32.5 meters in length, and its shells were equally massive. Krupp engineers and designers spent the better part of the 1930s and early 1940s perfecting the design, culminating in the first test firing on September 10, 1941. The results were both impressive and terrifying, the gun could hurl a 7-ton armor-piercing shell a distance of 23 miles. Krupp eventually constructed two of these colossal guns. The first, Schwerer Gustav, was provided to the German military free of charge, but the second gun, named Dora, came with a hefty price tag of 7 million Reichsmarks, equivalent to about $30 million today. These guns were mounted on specially designed chassis that required two parallel railway tracks, supported by eight bogies, to distribute their immense weight. The deployment of Heavy Gustav was a logistical nightmare. When it was sent to the Eastern Front to participate in the Siege of Sevastopol in 1942, a specialized railway spur line had to be constructed to bring the gun within range of its targets. This spur line stretched 16 kilometers north of Sevastopol, and at its terminus, the Germans built four semicircular tracks to allow the gun to traverse and aim at various Soviet fortifications. Additionally, outer tracks were laid to accommodate the massive cranes needed to assemble the gun. Heavy Gustav arrived at Sevastopol in early March 1942, accompanied by a train of 25 carriages that extended nearly 1.5 kilometers in length. Assembling the gun was an arduous task, requiring 4,000 German troops and taking five weeks to complete. The gun crew alone consisted of 500 men. By June 5, 1942, Heavy Gustav was finally ready for action. The gun's firepower was as impressive as its size. It could launch either a 7-ton armor-piercing shell or a 5-ton high-explosive shell every 30 to 45 minutes, though it never achieved this rate of fire during combat. Over the course of 12 days, from June 5th to June 17, 1942, Heavy Gustav unleashed 48 shells on various targets, including fortresses and ammunition depots, causing massive destruction. One of its most notable achievements occurred on June 6, when it targeted the Ammunition Mountain, an undersea ammunition magazine located 30 meters below water and protected by 10 meters of concrete. Remarkably, nine seven-ton shells obliterated the magazine and even sank a Soviet warship. The gun also targeted the massive coastal batteries within the Maxim Gorky fortresses. On June 17, 1942, Heavy Gustav fired five shells, successfully neutralizing Maxim Gorky I and inflicting significant damage on Maxim Gorky II. However, the gun's massive barrel quickly wore out and required replacement, illustrating the practical challenges of operating such an enormous piece of artillery. After the siege of Sevastopol, Heavy Gustav was relocated to Leningrad to participate in the ongoing siege of the city. However, just as the gun became operational, the planned offensive was cancelled, and Heavy Gustav was placed in storage for the winter. Its sister gun, Dora, was deployed near Stalingrad but was withdrawn to avoid capture during the Soviet encirclement of the city. 
Ultimately, neither gun saw significant action after these campaigns. Their immense size made them easy targets for enemy aircraft, and as the war progressed, their strategic value diminished. In April 1945, as the war drew to a close, the Germans destroyed both guns to prevent them from falling into Allied hands. Heavy Gustav was blown up on April 14, 1945, and its remains were discovered in a forest 50 kilometers southwest of Chemnitz. The Soviets studied the ruins before they were sent to Merseburg in the autumn of 1945, after which the gun disappeared from history. Dora met a similar fate, being destroyed on April 19, 1945, and what little remained was scrapped in the 1950s in West Germany. However, the story of German superguns did not end with heavy Gustav and Dora. The Germans had even more ambitious plans for an even larger gun, the Langer Gustav. Unlike its predecessors, Langer Gustav was designed with a smaller caliber of 52 cm and was intended to be stationed in Calais, France, to bombard London. Instead of conventional shells, it would have fired long-range rocket projectiles weighing 680 kg, with a staggering range of 190 km. Had it been completed, Langer Gustav could have unleashed a terrifying bombardment on the British capital, reminiscent of the earlier Blitz. Fortunately, the nightmare scenario was averted. The Royal Air Force bombed the gun plant at Essen several times, damaging the only example of Langer Gustav under construction, which was never completed. The Schwerer Gustav and Dora represent the pinnacle of Nazi Germany's obsession with grandiose and technically impressive weapons. While they were engineering marvels, their actual impact on the battlefield was minimal compared to the vast resources required for their construction, deployment, and operation. In the end, these behemoths serve as a cautionary tale of the limits of military technology when it comes to practicality and effectiveness in warfare.